Hey guys, if you have your Bibles, hope you do. Acts chapter 3 is where we're going to be today. So take out your sermon notes, see if the Holy Spirit might say something to you. You can write it down. Uh, Let's say, hey, a special good morning to our friends at Folsom Prison, our brothers who are there at Folsom Prison. Grateful that we're getting to worship with you today. Also, you know, I don't know if you've heard this, around here at Bayside, we're trying to change the odds of marriage and family, and one of the great opportunities we have to do that is this Wednesday night. We're going to have a marriage one night specifically for those who are in blended marriages, blending families. It's a great opportunity, so if you have some friends, you can invite them to that. Just text Married Life to 56316, and uh, we'll have a great time Wednesday night. Acts chapter 3 is where we're going to be. They say the four most interesting words in the human language are once upon a time. Those are, those, are, those are interesting words. There are other phrases that are four words that are interesting as well. I mean, these days, probably my favorite four words I can hear these days is, this meeting is over. <laughs> um, I've always liked, it's time for lunch. <laughs> Depending on your life setting, hurry home, kids gone. They're hypothetical words, but the words I would love to hear are world champion Dallas Cowboys. Boo all you want to boo. It's not going to happen. It doesn't doesn't matter. (laughs) Once upon a time, it it, it engages the mind. The human mind is meant to learn in the midst of story. We're we're born into families, and so we start to learn our our family story, our heritage, our history, the story about our country, the story uh, about our faith. We actually can't know about ourselves outside of story. It's no accident that the Bible is actually one long story from beginning to end with many different parts. And once upon a time sets us up to then enter into, that's what happens with stories. We actually enter into them. We, we, we find our place in the story and, and we observe wherever the author or the writer wants us to observe from. And in so doing, it changes who we are. It, it, it broadens our perspective of the world, gives us compassion toward other people uh, once upon a time. But those words are often then followed by just a couple of words, there was. And this is now the, the writer showing us where they want to take us. This is, these are the people we want you to identify with. So, so once upon a time, there was a young teenage boy with magical powers whose caretakers didn't believe what he was doing was magic. And that's how Harry Potter begins. Once upon a time, there were some teenagers having a party at the beach when a couple slipped off and, and one of the girls went out into the water and then she disappeared. That's how Jaws began. (laughs) Once upon a time, there was a parolee getting paroled, and as he left prison, he began to reconnect with his old friends to to put together an even bigger heist, and that is the beginning of Ocean's Eleven. Twelve, (laughs) thirteen, fourteen, forty-seven. Hey, did did y'all did y'all read on social media that we had a thief around here? Uh, thankfully, Placer County Sheriff's, our own security team, did a great job uh, of, of arresting this person. We, we hope that person gets rehabilitated. Matter of fact, we hope he begins to attend one of our campus at Folsom Prison. We would love to have him uh, where his life could be transformed and changed, but, but we did. We had, we had somebody steal from us. They, he stole three cameras, two speakers. He returned 100 copies of The Problem of God. Once upon a time, there was. Today's passage is a once upon a time passage. So so we're in the book of Acts, unstoppable, the history of the church. And Acts chapter 1 shows us that that Jesus, now resurrected from the dead, ascends into heaven. Acts chapter 2, he he sends his long-awaited promised Holy Spirit, now filling all the people. And then Pastor Ray talked about last week. Now, uh, the early church was gathered together. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and then also to prayer. And so that's how the first two chapters intro the book of Acts. And then in chapter 3, we read, once upon a time. So after that, what happened? So what? The church was doing this. So what? What happened? Chapter 3 tells us. Let's start reading in verse number 1. One day, once upon a time, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful 
where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with him into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Chronic Morphogenesis. We all have it. I don't know if you were aware of it, but we all possess it now. It's a, it's a chaotic morphogenesis. It's how the, the eyes are formed in the womb, and it creates such a unique code that your right eye is actually different than your left eye, and all of our eyes are different from everybody else's eyes. Uh, chaotic morphogenesis creates this fingerprint in the eye. So, Years ago, whenever the prophet said, the, the poet said that, that, that the eyes are a window to the soul, little did the poet know how truthful they were. Whenever I was little, I couldn't even look my parents in the eye. All the way up in the teenager's years, I couldn't look my parents in the eyes when I was mad at them because if I looked them in the eyes, my anger would just melt away. That's not a condition my sister had. She could look at them with fire in her eyes. Whenever I travel across the country and do a marriage uh, conference, there, there comes a point where I want to illustrate now this idea of friend, partner, and lover, what a, what a marriage is all about. And I have all the couples stand. I have them hold hands side by side and say, this is what friendship looks like. I have them turn back to back and talk about, this is what partnership looks like where you have each other's back. And then I have them turn face to face, look each other in the eye. This is intimacy where you're completely seen and loved in totality. And yet the moment I do that, I lose their attention. There's something that happens Whenever eye contact is made, whenever we look each other in the eye, there becomes now this, this pathway by which we can connect. As we look at this passage in Acts, there's, there's a specific verse that stands out to me more than any other. It is verse number four where it says that Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and then Peter said, look at us. There, there is this... This magic moment here where Peter and John and this lame man make eye contact. And as soon as eye contact is made, there is now the climate in which change can take place. Without the eye contact, without the human connection, without the humanity being shared in this moment, there's, there's no potentiality of, of what the Holy Spirit can actually do. And yet the moment that they lock, lock eyes, in that moment there is possibility. And we're going to look at that possibility today. But, but first, how do we get to verse Number four, well, the text shows us that, that, that one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer about three in the afternoon. Some of your translations might say it was the ninth hour. So on three different occasions during the day, the temple would open up for the people to come in and where they could pray both corporately and, and also individually. So if you imagine the 6 a.m. as the beginning of the day or as a, a zero hour, then, uh, then three hours later, the third hour at 9 a.m., and at the sixth hour at noon, and at the ninth hour, 3 p.m., people would gather in the temple and they would then pray. We were told at the end of Acts chapter 2 that the, that the early church was devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and also to prayer. And so the beginning of chapter 3, we now see this devotion to prayer has led Peter and John now to go up to the temple to pray in this moment. But, but notice this. Don't miss this connection of Peter and John. We hear those names so often that we, we often forget about the personalities involved. Peter and John. Is it possible to have two people more different than Peter and John? Peter, this, this bombastic a leader, courageous and, and, and bold, bold even in situations he wasn't even supposed to be bold, uh, bold in that he, could, Jesus, call me out on the water and I'll, I'll walk with you, pulling the sword and cutting off the soldier's ear before Jesus had even asked, boldly proclaiming, Jesus, I will never fail you in any way. Uh, Peter now, this, this force of a person, and John, caring, compassionate, kind John, who was there at the cross taking care of the mother 
of Jesus. John, who was described in, the, in one of the Gospels as the disciple that Jesus loved. It happened to be his Gospel where he was described in that way. But you have these two contrarian kind of personalities. Peter, this Enneagram 8, wing 7. There's no 9 about Peter uh, whatsoever. And, and John, this Enneagram 4, wing 5, quiet, reflective, uh, poetic in so many ways. You have an artist and, and then you have a force of nature. And yet because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, these two opposites, these two people who would kind of repel one another because of the, the joint power of the gospel, they find unity in what's going on. It's a reminder to us that we need other people. We need to serve alongside side, people who don't look like us, who don't think like us, who have strengths that we don't have, and their strengths can compensate for our weaknesses, and our strengths can compensate for their weaknesses. You, you, can, you need to find people to minister with that are radically different than you. Jesus sent the disciples out two by two, and he didn't send two of the same kind. And so, people ask, how do you work with Mark Clark? <laughs> the same way John worked with Peter. He makes me better. I love him. He makes me better. He can do things that I could never do. And yet he can do, he can do some things that calls me out of the shell of who I am to begin to try things because of our, our, our bond that we have in the gospel. Golf and primarily the gospel. These two radically different personalities can now complement one another. And he makes me better because of who he is. Peter and John now, these diverse personalities are going up doing ministry together. You need to find people like that. Now, now notice what happens. This text... This text begins very quickly. Verse number one is meant to be read very quickly. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon, and then it slows down. Verse two slows down, and he's going to, the author is going to invite you into experiencing the plight of the third character. And the third character, notice his nameless. Why wasn't he given a name? Is it possible it's because nobody knew it? He had a name. His mama gave him a name. But nobody knew it. They'd grown up with him. They, 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 he was the talk of the town when he was born. But nobody ever found out the name. And, and, and Dr. Luke here is going to go into a very specific detail to invite us into experiencing the the plight of his suffering. And so he, he begins with his first description. Now, uh, a, a man. So, so we, we have this assumption of a man, no longer a child. Now, being able to have his own strength, being fully grown, his own power, his, his brain is fully functioning at this moment. He can go wherever he wants to in society. He can lead. He can provide. Uh, notice in this culture, not ours, but in this culture, a, a woman wouldn't have any identity, much value at all. A child wouldn't either. But here you have a man, the centerpiece uh, of this culture, the centerpiece of strength. Now you have have a man who was lame. So this, this man who was supposed to be fully in charge of himself now has a condition that doesn't allow him to express the fullness of who he was meant to be. And you, you start to picture the suffering. Some of you don't have to picture it very hard. You already have the condition. You, maybe you aren't what you once were. You can feel it. You have to lean and depend upon other people. Maybe you were born with it in the same way, but, but there's a condition that kind of marks you out just a, a little bit. And we see this contrast now between a man who was lame and we begin to, to our hearts begin to bleed with empathy in this moment. And, and then Dr. Luke begins to drive it home. He was lame from birth. There was a, never a time in which he didn't know this condition, never a time in which he didn't understand this, this aspect of what was going on. There was, there was always this, this moment, there was always this, this comprehension of, uh, of what was going on from birth was being 
carried now, completely dependent uh, upon other people. Do you know how hard it is sometimes to, to lean on other people, to ask for help? Well, this man had no choice whatsoever. He had to humble himself every single day, and he was completely dependent uh, upon wherever and whomever could carry him in this moment, which now broadens our perspective of this suffering. You see, when, when an individual suffers, it's not just the individual. There's a community around them. Imagine the sorrow of these parents, the siblings who were there, the aunts and uncles, the the community who he now had to depend upon and with good intentions and compassions they would carry him but it had to be demanding at times and they had to at times wonder what would it be like not to have to do this what would it be like to be free from this but even within that they feel the guilt of what's going on for even feeling some sense of resentment of the very thing that they call a privilege to do which is to serve this one that they love some of you know that some of you in this room right now you know that sorrow you're taking care of a parent, and, and you, you serve and love, and you're giving to them what they would give to you, but there are moments. Some of you know what it's like to parent a child with special needs. You, you, you know what your spouse was like before the accident, what they're like after the accident. You're part of that community who feels helpless so often, and, and yet there's so many demands he was carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put. Just feel that. I've talked before that one of the basic human needs of a human being is agency. This idea that we have a say. As soon as my kids were just old enough to figure out a yes and a no, I wanted to empower them with choices to let them begin to see that your choices impact your life. This man had no choice. One of the things we're doing with World Vision is try to empower these kids to begin to show some agency about them themselves where they get to choose the person that's going to sponsor them. This man had no choice. Wherever he was placed, that's where he was placed. Every day. Not some days. Not a few days. We were in the DMV on Friday, speaking of suffering. And I was just standing kind of in the corner as Silas was taking a test. And I watched this man just, just lose his cool on this worker behind the desk. And I, we get it. Like, I mean, I've never done that, but I'm a pastor. I, you know, I can't. I've thought it. Um, but as I'm sitting there watching that, and finally he storms out. And he, here's all I know. I, I only know two basic things. My guess is he was probably right in that they were demanding things of him that aren't fair. But my guarantee is it wasn't that woman's fault. She didn't make the law. She didn't make the rules. She has to sit there and enforce them and then take the wrath. And I looked at the look on her face, and I thought, dear God, for that poor woman. Imagine having to sit here every single day. But then it hit me. It's Friday. Thank God for the weekend. I don't know what her marriage is like. I pray it's a great one. She deserves a saint of a husband who loves her every day because of what she has to put up with Monday through Friday dealing with us. This guy never got a weekend. There was never a moment. There was never a break. This community never got a weekend. The caretaking had to continue. Notice how the text is slowing down. And he had to beg. He had to beg. Every single day, he had to beg from people to get something from them in hopes that that would be enough to last him to the next day. And there was never gathering enough for, for the next week. There was never a couple weeks uh, vacation. There was never, hey, carry me down to Newport. Let me lay on the beach for a little bit to rest up from what's going on here. This was an everyday process. This man who was lame from birth being carried every day wherever he was placed without a break and he had to beg. The text now slowly down to invite you in to experience the plight of this man. And then verse number three is the least surprising verse in all the text. When he saw Peter and John now about to enter the temple, he asked them for money. 
So this is something part of, of Jewish culture, right? As they're going into prayer, and, and by this time, 3 o'clock in, in, in the afternoon, pr- chances are the double gates of, of this gate were probably open. There were a good number of people walking this very familiar path, and, and so there's probably a great number of people with different you know, conditions. You, you had those who were handicapped from birth, like this man. You had these who had maybe accidents. You had some older people, maybe had nobody to take care of them. You might have had some addicts who, who were there. You might have had some people who were mentally kind of out uh, of their minds. You might have had some, some false people who who were there, who were trying to take advantage and get for free because they didn't want to work. You had all these people lining the way as the people went in uh, to worship, and it was the expectation that they would give alms, that they would take a part of what they had received, uh, some, of the, some of the jingle that they had gotten that week in their pocket, that they would take it and they begin to throw it out as a form and a, and a sort now of worship to God. So basically, before you go into the temple and pray, give to somebody else. Before you go beg of God, give to the beggar around you. Some of you wonder why we take up an offering right here. This is the very reason. Before we ask of God, before we pray to God, uh, before we even worship God, we now, as a sovereign act of faith and trust, give of ourselves to God and then come to him as children and say, all right, God, here's what we desire. It was an outward act that was expected. And yet, the routine happened maybe so often that chances are if you were a Jewish boy, you would grow up in this, and whenever you were young, you might begin to ask questions. Well, what about that person? What about that person? Your parents would kind of shush you because that's rude. Until the time that you're 35, and now you're just walking in thinking, make no eye contact. Throw the money, but don't actually see the people. Just go. Because if you see, there's going to be responsibility. And so let me check the box. Let me throw the money to get in and do what it is that I've come to do. But don't make me interact with the humanity. So Peter and John are walking in. And this man now is is just begging. And that leads us then to what is from the most predictable verse in verse 3 to the most unexpected verse in verse 4. And that is that Peter looked straight at him. I wonder why. How many times did Peter walk this road? Is it possible? Is it possible that the reader, the reason Peter looked at him at this time, where maybe he hadn't looked at him all the, all the other times, is it, is it possible that Peter had had such a transformation now, having, having rejected Jesus, having denied Jesus, having experienced the, the crucifixion and the, uh, the burial and, and the suffering, but even the excitement when Jesus rose back from the dead, thinking to himself, well, I, I'm outside of it. I, I, I've caused this in some way. He's never going to love me. But then out fishing in John chapter 21, uh, Jesus then sees Peter. Peter uh, swims to the shore. Jesus is cooking breakfast. They go along for a walk, and Jesus restores Peter three times. Is it possible that the reason Peter sees this lame man here is because Jesus saw Peter in the midst of his own sin, and having received that sight, Peter now is trying to give it to other people? Is it possible? Is it possible that whenever we begin to experience the grace of God, that we begin to see people in a radically different light, those that culture would throw away, that deny, would pretend doesn't even exist, that we now see as ourselves, as representations of our own selves, and our eyes begin to look, because we're on mission with God, because we're filled with compassion from God, that we begin to see people that nobody else begins to see. Is it possible that in Granite Bay, this could be the group of people who actually sees hopelessness, who doesn't deny its existence, who doesn't pretend like it's a sacramental problem, but actually because of the grace that we have seen, we see people who are struggling in the midst of food insecurity, struggling in the midst uh, of being abducted, of being abused, of being an outcast, an alien, an orphan, and we begin to look people in the eye. Is it possible? Is it possible? Or, Or is it possible that now, empowered by the Holy Spirit, Peter's starting to grow and mature, and those, the fruit of the Spirit is starting to grow within him. Love, joy, peace. Oh, patience. Oh, Peter, you're finally getting some patience about you. You're learning that you don't always draw the sword and ask questions later. Peter, you're really willing to slow down. And the very thing that irritated you about Jesus, Jesus always seeing the lame man here and the child that was there and the woman that touched him with the issue of blood that was here. Uh, Peter, as you were always trying to rush Jesus along to the next event, and Jesus was always seeing people, which was slowing him down, is it possible that, Peter, you are now becoming like Jesus? Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. 
So you get this picture of this man now begging, but his posture is downward. He's looking, he's laying and looking downward. Why is that? Is it possible that he has learned that when asking something from somebody, you don't look them in the eye lest you provoke their evil? In the same way that a dog that's been beaten will cower? Is it possible that this man who in that culture would have no value whatsoever? It's not like if somebody kicked him or slapped him or spat upon him, the police would show up and say, hey, this is inhumane treatment. No, nobody would care. Nobody would, would bat an eye. Even as they were walking in the temple, uh, nobody would care uh, about the abuse in that moment. Is it possible this man uh, laying on the side of the road one too many times had looked up at the wrong person and the man that was passing by didn't have the ability to beat his wife, didn't have the ability to beat his children, didn't have the ability to, to express his angst anywhere else, but seeing somebody with no value might throw him something, but at the same time, might kick him so the man wouldn't look up or is it possible this man was so overwhelmed by his own shame this was not a life that he wanted or desired or asked for and, and he, he's almost embarrassed to now have to live his whole, whole life begging from other people or is it possible that this is a man who simply lost all hope how long how, how long, how old was this man? He's been doing it his whole life. And he's now lost his sense of hope to where he just looks down. But Peter says, look up. It's a gift that we have as a church. To people who have lost their hope, who have lost any sense of value or knowledge or understanding of who God has created them to be. To the student who sits at the lunch table all by themselves, never making eye contact with you. It's us that has the power to come alongside of them and say, hey, look at me. I'm going to see you. I'm going to know you. I'm going to understand you. It's one of the base values and needs of a human being to be seen, to be valued, to be heard, to be understood. And Peter, in this moment, having received life from Jesus, was able to give that life to this man where everybody else was ignoring him Peter was able to say look up and the man looked and notice what the text says in verse number five so the man gave them his attention expecting something from them but little did he know what he would actually get and so in verse number six the text says Peter says silver or gold I do not have but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus, Christ of Nazareth, walk. Silver or gold, I do not have. I, I learned this verse, silver or gold have I none, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus, Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Isn't it interesting? Notice here, it's their lack that actually creates the pathway for ministry. It's the fact that they don't have you see, I tend to think, well, if I had, if I had something, man, think about the work I could do. Pastor Ricky was preaching uh, a couple weeks ago, and he used the illustration. At the time, the lottery was a billion dollars, and he said, imagine if you won the lottery, right? And so my, my daughter, Ella, is over here. She's probably not paying attention to me right now, but Pastor Ricky was here, and she was paying attention to Pastor Ricky, and she texted me, and she said, hey, Kevin, or Dad, not Kevin. <laughs> hey, Pastor Kevin. Um, she said, hey, Dad, if you won the lottery, what would you do? I thought it was a great question. The girl's paying attention to the, to the sermon of, of what's going on. I love it. Have a guest preacher, and, and she's paying attention. Now, last week, Pastor Ray was preaching, and she texted me, hey, will you come sit with me? And I said, hey, I went to service last night. And she said, okay, I'm going to go to sleep then. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Do with that what you will. I think she just has such a trust. She trusts him. But I was thinking about what would you do if you won the lottery? And my mind goes to all the positive things I would do, the, the causes I would be involved in, the, the ways I could invest within the church, the people I could help. I, I'd love to just start surprising people with $100,000 here and a, hundred, a billion dollars. Now think about that. You take the payout, so that's $600 million. Okay, you live in California, that's $200 million. <laughs> Think about what we could do with that. And our minds go to all the possibility. But notice this. The moment we possess something, it actually can become a hindrance to ministry. Because then we have to start making the discerning question, are you 
more worthy of what I have than me. And that is not a battle you will win very often. Because I really care about me. And so by possessing something, it, it puts me in this deliberation. By having nothing, then I can freely give to you what's been given to me. What costs me nothing. The, the, the gospel is not a limited quantity now. It multiplies in every way. So by me giving to you, that in no way hinders it, receiving it myself. And so I can give to you and actually multiplies what I already have uh, within myself. And, and so actually lack now gives a pathway uh, to ministry. And there's some of us in this room who are thinking to ourselves, man, I, just, I wish I could serve. I, I just don't have the strength. I don't have the capability. I don't have the knowledge, the experience. I wish I could study scriptures the way uh, Mark does. I wish I could preach the way uh, Kurt does but I don't have any of those things. And so there's nothing that I can do not recognizing it's actually your inability that is a privilege. It's your lack now in this moment that sets you up to serve in a way that you never could have. Silver or gold have I none. And that prepared them for ministry. And yet we have to tell the truth, silver or gold have we some. And now with that comes a responsibility to whom much is given, much is expected. Jesus gives to us so that he can then give through us to others. But here's the problem with having. When you and I have, if we're going to serve, we tend to depend upon what we have. But if you and I recognize that we have nothing and we want to serve, we will depend upon him. And Jesus can do far more with nothing than you and I can do with something. And so the very thing that some of you think are holding you back from actually doing meaningful ministry and touching lives is actually the very advantage that you have, the fact that you have nothing. And so he says, I give to you what I have in the name of Jesus. Mark will talk about that next week. In the, in the nature, it's the power now of Jesus that allows this to actually happen. And then the miracle takes place and he says, walk. And this man who's been lame his entire life the rest of the text then kind of shows, don't worry, I know you're looking at the clock, we're just going to summarize this. The rest of the text now then shows, uh, with a quickening pace again, it, slow, it started fast, slowed down, and now it's picked up. But with a quickening pace, how quickly this miracle actually happened. So they took him by the right hand, he helped him up, and notice this. Now instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and, and began to walk. And then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Uh, when all the people saw him, now notice Dr. Luke, he's driving this home. Now walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to them. The same way the church in Acts chapter 2 was filled with this wonder and amazement. And this miracle now takes place in this moment. Now my question is this, why is this text here? Why, why is this the story? Well, in part, Jesus has told his disciples, you're going to do some amazing things. And this was proof of that. It, it encouraged the apostles now to recognize, hey, in the midst of having nothing, we have everything that we need. Let's go and serve. It, it gave boldness to, the, to the, the first church. Now, God is at work and doing something in recognition to the very message that they were going to proclaim. But more than anything, this story is here because of what Mark's going to preach about next week, which is Peter is now going to walk in and preach a sermon. And the point of the sermon, and who better preach this than Mark, is you killed him. And it's going to cause the people to go, oh my goodness, we killed the very one that was the power that allowed this man to be raised. And then Peter's going to say, but good news, the same power that raised this man can forgive you. And, and literally as... As Peter preached, that verse number 11, you can go ahead and read your Bible. Verse number 11 says that as Peter preached, this man hung on to Peter. So as Peter is saying, horrible news, you killed the Son of God. Good news, you can be forgiven. It would cause you to think in your mind. Think about those in Folsom Prison right now who, who know they did, they did what they said they did. And everybody knows it. They can think to their own hearts and minds. Who could ever forgive that? How can I have any value or worth whatsoever? And they're so defined by what they have done because everybody knows what they did. It causes them to think there's no hope for me. And Peter's now saying there is hope for you as proof. And all along the way, this man who was lame, who was just begging outside the gate, is now standing there in the temple amening the sermon as proof of the very thing that Peter 
is proclaiming. Now listen, dear friend. There are some in this room who you do not have a relationship with Jesus. And what you need to do at this moment is you need to look up. You need to look up. Maybe it's your own shame that has caused you to think about the idea of God or the fact that he could love you. And maybe it's your own deception which you've just made yourself so busy. Let's just pretend like God doesn't exist and see if we can get away with it. But either way, left to your own devices, you're helpless and hopeless. You need to look up. And the moment your eyes lock on to Jesus, there is now a pathway by which your entire future can begin to change. And what this story is telling us is there is nobody so far outside the power of God that God's grace cannot touch them. And that includes you. All you have to do is look up. Now, for the rest of us in this room, there's a different command of what it is that we now need to do. We need to walk. You see, notice this. Stories invite us in to picture that we're one of the characters so we can learn and grow. And so this story invites us in, and we begin to think, all right, we're Peter and John. And in some ways, we are Peter and John. And just like Peter and John, silver and gold, have I none? What I do have, I give to you. Yeah, man, that's us. And so we have the privilege now carrying this message of, of causing and calling people to look up, of seeing people that nobody else sees. We have the privilege now to reach wide, teach deep, and unleash compassion. And this is our call, and it's a great call. We need to live that out. But listen, dear friend, in this story, first and foremost, you and I are not Peter and John. Don't walk out of this place feeling convicted because you're not being more like Peter and John. You and I are the lame man. We're the man who's helpless who's been suffering with this condition of sin our entire lives, who literally are so helpless, we just go wherever sin places us in this moment, completely dependent upon everybody else. And literally God, his grace, has now looked at us. We've experienced that grace. And now we need to rise up and walk. And notice what this text shows. Some of you might be thinking, man, I'd love to serve God's kingdom, but I can't preach, I can't communicate, I don't have a great testimony, I don't understand the scriptures. And you complicate things in a way that it's not necessarily complicated. What did this man do? All this man did was to begin to live the very life that God had given him, and it was in such contrast to the life that he at one time had that God changed the future by contrasting his present with his past. That's all you gotta do is walk. All you gotta do is to begin to walk and jump and praise God and it will cause other people to begin to look at you and go, oh my goodness, what has happened to them? To begin to struggle along in that marriage in the midst of commitment, people will begin to look at that and say, what's going on with the joy that he now has within his heart? To begin to grow and walk in the, in the power of the Spirit. Now for some of us, there might be an instantaneous uh, kind of transformation that takes place. I talked to a friend of mine this week and he talked about it. instantly he was healed from alcohol. That's a beautiful thing to go from, uh, from from addicted to no taste in a moment. But for a good number of us, it doesn't happen instantly. It happens as we slowly walk the steps in the midst of celebrate recovery. It happens as we experience the slow transformation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here's my fear at Bayside. My fear at Bayside is there's a good number of people who've looked up and seen Jesus and have been commanded to walk and you and I are still lying along the road in our sin and our infirmities, not living the life that God has called us, robbing this community of the transformation that now is the very age Amen of the sermons preached from this pulpit. We need to walk. You need to walk. Whatever that means for you today, you need to take the next step. For some of you, you need to walk to the I raise my hand table and say, all right, I'm in in this moment. For some of you, you need to walk next week into the waters of baptism to make a public proclamation and bring all your friends to tell them, I'm now with Jesus. Some of you need to walk into celebrate recovery. Let go of this addiction. Learn new patterns of behavior. Some of you need to walk in the midst of a small group to surround yourself with other people. Some of you need to walk into counseling. Change this marriage in this moment. But as we do, don't feel the pressure or thinking you have to have it all together. All you have to do is to start living in a way that is radically different than the way that you live because of the grace of God that is now within you. You and I need to walk. Hey guys, Pastor Mark here, one of the senior pastors around here. So glad that you are actually part of Bayside Online. You really are part of our family. We have grown uh, over the last couple of years online a ton, and we really do consider you as part of our church family. So what that means is make sure you subscribe and share this, it's great. Uh, but also get in a community group 
Start watching the Bible study, start being engaged, even give. Uh, one of the ways that we can actually do online church and have this global community and even do the ministry of our campuses is by people partnering with us in the gospel, as Paul talks about in Philippians chapter one. And that means by your resources, financially, there are people all over the world getting blessed through what we do at Bayside. And so obviously part of that is giving and using and stewarding that for the glory of God. So we're super thankful if you do that. We'd love you to start doing that and just super thankful you're part of our church. So glad you're with us. Make sure that you let us know you're watching and part of this because we want to get in touch with you and thank you and serve you any way we can. Anyway, thanks guys and we will see you next week.